Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to go through the entire uh, June 2014 biology exam and that's for GCSE AQA biology and this is going to be the unit 1, so the B1 exam. This will of course therefore be a long video and feel free to pause and rewind as you like because we are going to go through every question. So let's dive straight in to the first page now. So question one says that we have food chains which flow, which show energy flow through organisms in a habitat. We should know that already. And we have grass, sheep, human. Okay. So the biomass in each stage of the food chain changes as food passes along the food chain. Now we are asked to draw a pyramid of biomass for the food chain and to label it. And this is for two marks. So. All we're going to do quite simply, there's no tricks here, is draw the biomass. Remember, this is not a pyramid of numbers. If it was a pyramid of numbers, then it may look slightly different. But for biomass, grass is going to weigh a lot more because there's so much more of it. So we're going to have the lower tier. And then the sheep who are going to eat the grass are going to weigh significantly less because they eat loads of grass and, and excrete most of it, don't actually maintain most of the mass. So the sheep might look something like this. And then the same sort of pattern, if humans are eating the sheep, then we are going to have something like that. So I'm going to write grass on the bottom, sheep in the middle, and human at the top. And there is nothing else to that. So that's two marks on the board. Moving on. Question 1B. Now we are f we are shown a table, table 1, with three separate food chains. So we have a look at the top one. We've got plants, sheep, then human. That's what we had previously. Then we've got plants, grasshoppers, frogs, trout, human. Then we've got plants straight to humans. So that's obviously humans eating vegetables or fruit. So question B says, in which chain will the greatest proportion of biomass and energy of the plants be passed to the humans. Now you should know that as you go through the trophic levels, energy is lost at each stage. So what you're looking for quite simply is the one with the least levels. And so the most direct route is here in C, you're going straight from plants to humans. There is no energy loss as it goes through a chain because straight from plants to humans. In B, we're going to have loss at this stage, this stage, this stage, and this stage. And so that would be the least efficient. So the greatest proportion is going to be in B. And so in the second part of this question, we are asked to give reasons why that chain uh, gives the greatest proportion of biomass. So the first part I've already said to you is that we have the greatest, oh, sorry, the fewest, fewest number of trophic levels. Because as you have more trophic levels, like in number, like in um, chain B, then you lose energy at each level. So that is basically stating why. And now we need to explain. Well, why at each level are you losing energy and therefore losing biomass? Well, if you think about it, each level represents an organism. So let's take a look at um, chain B. So the plants are eaten by the grasshoppers. But the grasshoppers need to use energy in order to grow, in order to move, in order to reproduce. And they also have to digest the food. They excrete some of it. And so biomass is lost. Okay. So loss at each stage as a result of movement. Okay. We can also say that is a result of respiration. So energy is lost as a result of that. Finally, as I said as well, each animal isn't going to be able to obtain all the energy. They actually can only digest part of it and so they'll excrete the other part. So, waste, I'll put in brackets here, excretion causes loss of mass at each level. Okay, so fairly straightforward so far. Let's take a look at the next question. Question two. So in question two, 
We're told animals and plants have features or adaptations that allow them to survive in conditions they live. Describe how animals and plants are adapted to survive in dry conditions such as deserts. And for each adaptation, describe how the adaptation helps the animal or plant to survive in the conditions. So here is the key word for the second part. Here is the key word for the first part. Okay, so basically we are asked to describe the adaptation and then describe how. That basically means explain. So explain how the ad adaptation helps the animal to survive in dry conditions. Now I'm going to use separate colors for this because we're going to make, we need to make points on both animals and plants. Now do notice that it says in the question you will be assessed on using good English. This means that you need to write in full sentences. I'm not going to write in full sentences so that we can just get the points down, but you will be awarded one mark. Okay, this is only one mark. Let me just label that there. One mark is awarded or not awarded for your use of English. Sorry, you can't quite see that. One mark. There we go. All right, I'm going to start with animals. So I'm just going to put A there. Animals are going to be written in red. Now let's think of an animal that lives in dry desert conditions. Well, the first obvious one is the camel. And the camel obviously has humps, which store fat. Okay, so that's the description. And how does that help them? Well, the fat store provides food, provides food or nutrition, nutrition, and water by respiration respiration so respiration allows the fat to be converted into water now the camel also has a large surface area to volume ratio so large surface area to volume ratio and what does this do well this maximizes Heat loss, heat loss. So with a large surface area, it means that more heat can be lost at a time because there's more of the surface in contact with the environment, which means that the camel can cool down as quickly as possible. Whereas if it had a really low surface area to volume ratio, it wouldn't be able to cool down very quickly. And obviously if it was really hot, that poses a massive problem. Now there really are a fair few answers to this question. You could also say that a camel has wide feet and why does that help it? Well, in the desert, it doesn't want to sink in the sand. In some in some places, it would sink in the sand, bearing in mind how heavy it is. And so, the wide feet gives large surface area to prevent sinking. Now, I know I've focused on the camel because it is the classic desert animal. There are many other animals that you could use. You could use a desert mouse. You could use a desert fox. Um, you could use lizards, which are adapted in a different way. They change their behavior because they're cold-blooded. They need to lie flat sometimes, and sometimes they need to move around, and they need to get into the sun if their body temperature is too low. So there are a lot of animals you can use and a lot of different adaptations, but I don't have time to go through all of them. So now we're going to move on to plants. So plants, obviously going to use the cactus as the example, because that is the classic one. So what do cacti have? Well, they have spikes as leaves. Okay, spikes as leaves. And why is that helpful? Well, that reduces, it greatly reduces surface area. Now, the, the reduced surface area leads to uh, reduced water loss, and that is by transpiration. Okay, so because the surface area is greatly reduced, it means that water is lost at a much lower rate. Now, what else uh, does the cactus have which helps it? Well, another classic one is the roots. So it has long and or widespread roots. And obviously, this helps in two ways. The main one is allows 
absorption of more water so it can collect more water and it also anchors the plant during wind because the desert is such an open environment if there's a lot of wind then there's no protection so it needs to be anchored into the sand so that's a secondary uh, benefit from those roots lastly I'll give you one more and that is the thick stem okay cactus or cacti have thick fleshy stems and this means that they can store a lot of water and it also uh, reduces the surface area to volume ratio so it means that less water is lost by transpiration again but the main one is that it stores a lot of water okay now there are more but that is more than enough to be getting on with that's more than enough to get the full six marks for this question all right let's move on right let's have a look at question three it says most birds sit on their eggs to keep them warm until they hatch well, we all knew that megapode birds dig a large hole in the sand they fill the hole with dead plants and then they lay their eggs on top of the dead plants They then cover this surface with a thick layer of sand all right sounds pretty strange now shows us a little diagram here but question 3a says the dead plants in the nest decay the decaying process helps to keep the eggs warm for many weeks suggest how now notice that it said suggest this means that you're not um, specifically taught this process so you know you haven't probably learnt about megapode birds laying est laying their eggs um, before but using what we do know suggest how well first of all we need to know that the decay process you have learnt about decay decay is carried out by microorganisms. When plants have died, the microorganisms basically digest those plants. They take the energy out of the plants and they recycle the nutrients in the plants. So they're using up uh, they're using up energy uh, in order to digest those plants. Now, just like other living things, what do microorganisms do? Well, these microorganisms, be they bacteria or fungi, they are going to have to get their energy from somewhere. That process is the same as how we get our energy, and that is respiration. So the microorganisms, microorganisms respire. And respiration, as you should know, releases heat. So that's why we pant. Okay, when we're too hot, we pant and we get rid of excess heat. Uh, microorganisms respire and heat is released. Releasing heat. And of course, the heat released keeps the eggs warm. All right, now let's take a look at the second part of the question. So question 3b, we are told megapode birds open and close the air vents of the nest at different times of the day. Suggest reasons why it is necessary, necessary sorry, to open and close the air vents. Now there are a lot of answers to this question and what you've got to think basically this leads on from the previous question. In the previous question we mentioned that respiration is the reason why heat uh, is released and can warm the eggs up and warm the nest up. Now, what are the conditions required for respiration? Well, for respiration, you need oxygen and you need to be able to get rid of your waste, which is your carbon dioxide. And so, we can say straight away that opening vents allows constant source of oxygen. Perfect. And so that was two points, really, because on the flip side, opening also allows waste CO2 to be released. 
So the waste CO2 is allowed to escape only because you've opened the vents. Now, if you think about it, why else would you open and close the vents? Well, at night time, it can get very cold. And so if we left the vents open, then the nest would cool down very quickly. We don't want that, of course. We want to retain as much heat as we can. So we can say that closing the vents allows heat to be retained when cold. And I'll put in brackets there, night, because it's normally at night when it's going to be the most cold. Now that's good. That's three marks in the bag. There are many other answers. For example, I haven't even mentioned uh, the water content or the moisture. Obviously, microorganisms and decay works best in moist conditions. Opening the vents will allow moisture to escape. Uh, but if it's really wet outside and humid, it might allow moisture to get in. Likewise, closing might retain the moisture. So if moisture um, is going to be evaporated when it's hot, closing the vents might retain the moisture. So there are lots of things there that you can say as long as you put it in the right context. But to save space, I'm going to leave it as it is at the moment because those are three valid points. Okay, now lastly, let's move up slightly. Lastly, we are told the sex of the megapode bird that hatches from an egg depends on the temperature at which the egg was kept. Use this information to suggest why it's important for megapode birds to control the temperature of their nests. Okay, and this is one mark, so you only need to say one thing, really. Now, obviously, if, for example, there are loads and loads of female birds, but not a lot of male birds being born, then you might want to adjust the temperature of the nest in order to make sure that you have some male offspring. And so that summarized is allows maintenance of gender balance. Okay. That is basically it. So the birds can basically control the balance of gender in the population by adjusting the temperature of the nests. Okay, now that's the end of question three. So let's move on. Question four. Question four says the MMR vaccine is used to, pro to protect sorry, against measles. Apart from measles, which two other diseases does the MMR vaccine protect against? Now, you should know that MMR stands for the three diseases. That's measles, mumps, and rubella. So, we're going to write mumps, and we're going to write rubella for the first mark. So, in the next part... It tells us to read this information. Measles is a dangerous disease caused by a virus. That's true. Normally, MMR vaccines are given at one year old and again at four years old. Each vaccine is 90% effective at protecting against the virus. Right, so in April of 2013, there were 630 cases in children aged four and over in a small area of the UK. Of those, 504 had not been vaccinated against MMR at all, and only a few had been given a second vaccination. Right, so it tells us to calculate the percentage of children who caught measles in 2013 in April who had not been vaccinated against MMR. Right, now this is a simple percentage calculation. A percentage is basically a fraction. I often see students get confused with how to do percentage calculations. Think of it as asking give this as a fraction of the total, right? Write it as a fraction, and then to instead of leaving it as it is, just times the answer by 100 to get your percentage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, how many cases were there? Well, there were 504 who hadn't been vaccinated. Out of how many in total cases were there? 630. So that's the fraction, right? To get that as a percentage, all we do is we multiply the answer by 100. And I'm going to put that in my calculator, and I get an answer of exactly 80. But because I've got three significant figures here, I'm going to write 80.0%. Now, you would actually get the marks for just writing 80. I just prefer to do it to the same amount of significant figures as is given in the question. Right, so our answer is 80 or 80.0%. 80 
All right, now the next question asks, suggest one advantage to the population as a whole of children having the second vaccination. All right, now this is only a one mark question. This could easily have been a two or three mark question because we could be talking about herd immunity here. But we only need one mark. And the obvious advantage is that there's less chance of the disease spreading. So that's all I'm going to write. Less chance of disease spreading. And that's good enough for one mark. We could say that if you give the second vaccination to children, then it means that they are less likely to contract the disease, meaning the children who haven't been vaccinated are also less likely of to catch the disease okay that's another um, reason why it's good but for one mark we only need to say one point so this would do for now let's move on to the next question so question 4c we are asked in the first part what does a vaccine contain and this is for one mark as well well the most common form of va a vaccine contains dead pathogens okay that's not the only thing it contain it could contain inactive, so they're still alive, but they're inactive pathogens. It could also contain antigens from pathogens. All of those are perfectly valid, and if you'd have put any of those three, you would have got the mark. So in the next part, we are asked, explain, okay, important, explain how a vaccination prevents infection. Well, first of all, when you have a vaccination, your body um, responds. So we have an immune response. Okay, so immune response produce uh, antibodies for the pathogen. Okay, now on reinfection, so if you are infected again, those antibodies are remembered. You, uh, you have a memory. So we have immune memory, which means on reinfection, antibodies are produced very quickly i'm going to say rapidly okay that's very important so on reinfection the antibodies are produced very quickly which means that the disease doesn't have time to take effect right so your last point is antibodies kill pathogens before infection slash disease okay and that equals resistance to that particular disease and that's how the vaccine works all right now part d we are told antibiotics can only be used to treat some infections that's very true explain why antibiotics cannot be used to treat measles now if we think back to the start of the question measles Measles is caused by a virus. I'm just going to write this on the side. This isn't part of my answer to start with, right? This is just to let you know. Measles is caused by a virus. And antibiotics, they are used to fight and kill bacteria. Bacteria and viruses are not the same thing, right? So that is going to be my first point, but I just wanted to write it there so you've got it. Now, measles is a viral disease disease okay antibiotics do not kill viruses they target bacteria okay so that's one point now why can't they kill viruses well viruses live within our own cells. 
right? So if we were to kill a virus, if we were to use an antibiotic, which is just going to kill the virus, it would kill our body cells as well, which obviously we don't want to happen because that's going to cause us even more problems. So we can't treat viruses with antibiotics. Now, viruses live within our cells because they're so small and they can't survive on their own. So they need to take advantage of our cells uh, in order to reproduce and that is how we get the infection okay so antibiotics only used for bacteria because they are separate cells and antibiotics can kill those all right now lastly why do antibiotics become less useful at treating an infection if the antibiotic is overused if it's overused this is only a one mark question if you overuse an antibiotic natural selection tells us that there are going to be a few individuals in a population which may mutate to have resistance okay they might be able to fight that antibiotic and if we supply that antibiotic all the other ones are going to die and natural selection kicks in and we get that bacteria who is resistant reproducing and making loads of them okay so bacteria develop antibiotic resistance okay so that is the end of question four okay so let's have a look at question five question five it says figure three shows how a nerve impulse passing along a relay neuron causes an impulse to be sent along another type of neuron neuron x so question 5a for one mark what type of neuron is neuron x now we should know that there are three types of neuron in the body only two types are always involved and the relay neuron is involved when we have a reflex arc and those are the sensory neuron which passes information to the relay neuron, which passes information to the motor neuron, okay? Now, bearing in mind, this is a relay neuron, and it's passing information to another neuron. That neuron must, therefore, be the motor neuron. Motor neuron. Right, so in the next part, we're asked to describe how information passes from the relay neuron to the neuron X, which is the motor neuron. Use figure three to help. Right, so the first part, I'm going to have a look here. I'm going to label them A, B, and C. Right, in the first part, we have an impulse traveling down the relay neuron. Now, we can see here that we have this chemical. It's only labeled chemical in the diagram, so I may as well use that in the question. That chemical is being prompted to be released into the synapse, which is this gap. So the first part is going to be chemical and if you want to be very clever that chemical is a neurotransmitter right but we can just say chemical released into the synapse okay and let's just put from the relay neuron sorry about the handwriting there all right so the next part in B, well now the chemical is making its way across. So we can say that the chemical moves from the relay neuron to the motor neuron. Right? So the chemical moves across the synapse to the motor neuron now if we want to be clever again rather than moves we can say diffuses because this chemical is moving down its concentration gradient and that's why it moves across and because it's not water it's not osmosis it is diffusion so um, that is another way you could word it it just looks better all right and then finally what's happening at the end well we can see the chemical has now attached itself to the motor neuron so I'm going to write chemical, uh, I could say arrives or attaches, attaches to motor neuron, right, it's actually attaching to the membrane, I'm going to say membrane there in brackets, all right, and causes 
an impulse. And so that is basically how an impulse gets from the relay neuron to the motor neuron. And that is definitely worth three marks. All right, let's have a look at the next part. So 5C. Right, so it says, scientists investigated the effect of two toxins, okay, on the way in which information passes across synapses. Table 2 shows these results, and we have these two toxins. Now, forgive my pronunciation, the first toxin, curare, and the effect at the synapse is it decreases the effect of the chemical on neuron X, so the motor neuron. So it decreases the effect that that chemical has, and obviously remember that chemical is responsible for creating an impulse. Right, the second one, and I don't know how to pronounce that one, strychnine, probably strychnine or strychnine, that increases the amount of the chemical made in the relay neuron. So what we're doing here, we're not inhibiting anything, we're increasing the amount of the chemical, which is the neurotransmitter. So now the question is, describe the effect of each toxins on the response by the muscles. Now remember that this impulse being passed down the relay neuron uh, and eventually down the motor neuron leads to muscle contraction. So the first toxin, curare, decreases the effect of the chemical on neuron X and if you decrease that effect it means that less of an impulse is going to go down the muscle. And so therefore we are going to get less of a response, less of a contraction. So we're going to say less muscle contraction. Right? They would give you the marks also for saying no contraction, but because it says decreases the effect and it doesn't say completely inhibits, I'm not going to say no muscle contraction because I don't know that for sure. Right, the second one, strychnine or strychnine or whatever you want to call it, increases the amount of the chemical made in the relay neuron. That means that more of the chemical is going to go across the synapse, there's going to be more of a response from on the motor neuron, and so we're going to get increased uh, amount of impulses. And so this is going to have the opposite effect. It's going to increase muscle contractions. Alright, and because it just says describe the effect, not explain the effect, we don't have to explain it. I've explained it to you because obviously it's going to help, but you don't need to write those explanations because it's going to waste your own time. Okay, and that's the end of question five. All right, so let's move on to question six. Now, the first part, 6A, says that drugs can harm the body. We know that. And the drug thalidomide was originally developed in the 1950s. What was the drug thalidomide originally developed to treat? Now, this is one that people can get confused because, obviously, we know that thalidomide was developed to treat morning sickness. But that's not what it was originally developed for. We've looked at the, um, the example where they found that it could be used to treat morning sickness. But the ori originally, it was a sleeping pill. So it was used to treat poor sleep. So poor sleep, I'm going to put in brackets there, sleeping pill. Because anything like that, reference to bad sleeping, poor sleeping, or that it's a sleeping pill, is going to get you the mark. Right, so part two, this is the part I was talking about. Soon after it was developed, the thalidomide was found to be useful in treating another condition. What was this condition? And this is morning sickness. Morning sickness, which is obviously in pregnant women. All right. So the next part, part three. Describe one harmful effect of thalidomide. Well, it's well documented that pregnant mothers, when they took this pill, their babies, a lot of them anyway, their babies were born with limb abnormalities, they were uh, born with short arms, short legs, so any of these would be fine as an effect. So I'm going to say short limbs, and say slash defects in limbs. All right, so part four. It asks us to suggest why this harmful effect had not been detected during clinical trials. Well, clinical trials, basically, they're targeted. So the thalidomide was originally developed to treat poor sleep. It wasn't originally developed to treat morning sickness. It was just found that this was something that it was good for. So 
The trials hadn't been specifically on pregnant women or on pregnant animals before we got to human trials. So the trials were not targeted at pregnant individuals. Okay, so this includes animals and eventually humans as well. Because it was used to treat poor sleep, it was used as a sleeping pill originally, they used just normal healthy people and not they didn't use the pregnant audience. So this is why that it wasn't flagged up originally. And that's why it went on to cause obviously massive problems for a lot of people. All right then, 6B. It says using a recreational drug may cause a person to become dependent on the drug. Okay, that's true. What happens in the body to make someone dependent on a drug? Okay, so we know that what this is describing is someone being addicted. Now, that is not something that happens to the body. That is a symptom. That is the way that we describe their condition. It's not actually what happens to the body. What causes addiction, which is what it's asking here, is what happens in the body is changes in their metabolism. And the metabolism is obviously chemical processes. That's the simple way that we can describe it. So what we're going to say is that there are changes in chemical processes within the body. This causes dependence on the drug because the body then needs the drug to maintain this new state. All right, let's go on to the next part. Here we go. Okay, so part two. Doctors rated different recreational drugs according to how dependent users had become on them. And those are shown in figure four. So we've got dependence here on the left on the y-axis. Yep, up there. And then we have the different kinds of drugs along the bottom. And we can see, obviously, the most... Uh, the most addictive drug, so the one with the most dependence, is this one at the top, and that is heroin. And then we've got all sorts of other drugs um, across the bottom. Ones to look at, this one here, this is probably second, along with cocaine. That one is nicotine. Nicotine is obviously a legal drug, so that is actually quite disturbing in terms of how dependent you can become on that. So let's have a look at the question. It is legal, illegal, sorry, against the law to take class A, B or C drugs. Unclassified drugs, so they're the ones in white on your bar chart, are legal. Some people think that some legal drugs should be made illegal. What evidence is there in figure four to support this view? Now, this is basically using what I just said, because if you have a look, nicotine especially, um, it's very addictive and you can see that by its dependency score on the y-axis and alcohol is also pretty addictive right it's still beating anabolic steroids it's beating uh, or it's about level with cannabis it's beating ecstasy in terms of how addictive it is and it's about the same as LSD and so that's actually quite a lot nicotine beats all of those so both of those are actually pretty addictive so what we can say is that the dependency because that's what's on the y-axis, dependency of some legal drugs. Okay, for example, for example, nicotine is greater than many illegal drugs including cannabis, LSD, and uh, let's have a look at one more, and amphetamine. So that shows you really how addictive nicotine is. Okay, and that's two marks, because dependency on legal drugs is high, that's one mark, and giving examples uh, gives us the second one. Alright, now part three 
it asks us to suggest one other piece of information about legal drugs that would need to be considered before the classification of those drugs was changed. Now, it's all well and good being addicted to drugs, but, you know, if you were addicted to water and you always had to drink water, that would probably be quite a good thing because water is good for you. There aren't many bad side effects of water unless you drink a ridiculous amount of it. So what I'm trying to say there is that we need to know, are these drugs harmful? So one other piece of information could be how harmful the drugs are. And that would be enough for one mark. We could also put the side effects. So what side effects do these drugs cause and so on. Okay, so that is part three done. And that is the end of question six. Right, so let's have a look at question seven. We're told figure five shows Fiomia, an ancestor of elephants, and a modern African elephant. Now, the Fiomia lived 35 million years ago. You can clearly see a difference between the two. <coughs> so let's have a look at the question. It says, both Fiomia and the African elephant reach up into the trees to get leaves. In the 1800s, Darwin and Lamarck had different theories about how the long nose of Fiomia evolved into the trunk of the African elephant. In part one, it says, use Darwin's theory of natural selection to explain how the elephant's trunk evolved. Okay, let's have a quick look at the pictures again then. So, we can clearly see the difference between the two. Now, the Fiomia has this long nose, and it looks more like an anteater's snout, whereas the elephant clearly has a long trunk, and we know that they're very good for reaching up high and getting leaves. So, if one came from the other, then how did this happen? Well, the first thing is, of course, mutation. Okay, so mutation causes, or caused, it's in the past, caused variation in the population of Fiomia leading to some having the trunk. Okay. Now, what happens next? <clears throat> well, if, if, let's say, one individual has a trunk and the other has a long nose, which one is more likely to get food? Well, it's going to be the one with the trunk because it can reach higher up and it outcompetes everyone else. Whereas everyone else will be fighting to get the leaves which are lower down on the tree. There's no competition for the leaves higher up on the tree and the elephant um, or the fiomia at that, at that point can just reach up and grab it. So individuals with trunk are more likely to get more food and survive. Okay, so if one is more likely to survive than the other, then the third point is going to be survivors. Survivors, I'm going to put in brackets, with trunk can then successfully breed. So that's obviously just having kids. And therefore, genes for the trunk are passed down to offspring. Okay, over time, this leads to a new species. Okay. So that's four steps, really. We have mutation, so the introduction of the new gene, which gives you that new characteristic. 
That characteristic, if it's advantageous, means that those individuals are more likely to survive. If they survive, they then breed and pass down those genes. And when those genes are passed down over time, that leads to all of, all of the population having those genes, leading to a new species. All right, let's have a look at part two. So part two says Lamarck's theory is different from Darwin's theory. Use Lamarck's theory to explain how the elephant's trunk evolved. Okay, so if you don't uh, remember, please do have a look at my videos where I covered this, um, the theories of evolution. But Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, said, basically said that characteristics are passed down or not passed down, depending on how much the individual uses those characteristics. So it passes down useful characteristics and it gets rid of ones that it doesn't need. For example, his theory, if you had, let's say, um, a man uh, lifted weights a lot in the gym and got really big and strong, his theory would suggest that his children would therefore inherit that strong characteristic because the father has obtained that characteristic and it's useful for him and so the, the children would obtain that characteristic. Now we know that that's not true. You could easily have parents who are um, very athletic but then if the child doesn't undergo exercise then it's not going to grow to be big and strong. It's not... Uh, it's not that which is going to govern the uh, the characteristics, basically, of the offspring. So in this case, Lamarck will have suggested that the Pheomia, as it's trying to reach higher leaves, it will have stretched its nose. Stretched its nose to reach the leaves. Over time this will have um, gotten longer and longer. Nose grew longer. Full stop there just so I can make another point. This stretched nose was passed to offspring. And over a long period of time, if they keep stretching and stretching and stretching, you're going to get longer and longer and longer nose, which eventually now looks like a trunk. All right. We know that that theory really isn't uh, true. Darwin's theory is way more accurate, but this is Lamarck's theory. All right. So let's have a look at question B. So B part one says, in the 1800s, many scientists could not decide whether Lamarck's theory or Darwin's theory was the right one. Give two reasons why. Well, notice that it says in the 1800s. All right. Now, the first point, I'm going to say that in the 1800s, well, genes hadn't been discovered. Okay, DNA hadn't been studied properly. So, the mechanism of inheritance... And I'm going to put genes had not been fully discovered slash understood. So that means that they couldn't use those genes to prove Darwin's theory right. So there were question marks over both theories. Now that leads on to the second point that there wasn't actually any proof or disproof for either theory. So there was no hard proof or disproof for either theory. It was still open for debate because there was no evidence to tell you, nope, Darwin's is definitely right or Lamarck's is definitely right. And that's why it was hard to decide which one was correct. All right, part two. Before the 1800s, many people had a different idea to explain where all the living things on Earth came from. What idea was this? Well, before the 1800s, that's a broad statement because that's going back a long time in time. But before the 1800s, basically, religion was the way that everything was explained. Now, I can't just write religion because that's not an explanation people didn't have the idea that religion was where everything came from. They had the idea that God created everything or some sort of deity created everything. So I'm not going to write religion. Religion is the culture, if you like. But 
the idea was that God, I'm going to put an S in there because there are different uh, different religions and different um, types of gods, created the earth and living things. Okay, that was only one mark, so that's good enough for that. And that is the end of question seven. All right, so let's take a look at question eight. So it says, read the information. Insects can be both useful and harmful to crops. We know that's true. Insects such as bees pollinate the flowers of some crop plants. Pollination is needed for successful sexual reproduction of crop plants. Some insects eat crop plants and other insects eat the insects that eat crops. Okay, so you've got pests there and then you've got some insects that eat the pests, so they're good. Corn borers are insects that eat maize plants. A toxin produced by the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, don't know if I pronounced that right, kills the insects. Scientists grow Bacillus thuringiensis in large containers. The toxin is collected from the containers and is sprayed over maize crops to kill corn borers. So that's to get rid of the pests. A company has developed genetically modified GM maize plants. GM maize plants contain a gene from that bacteria. Not going to say it again. This gene changes the GM maize plants so that they produce the toxin. Describe how the scientists can transfer the gene from Bacillus um, thuringiensis, there we go, I had to say it again, to maize plants. All right, so this is a classic question about genetic engineering. The important thing here, though, is that we are transferring a gene into a plant, okay? We're not transferring it into bacteria. We can describe fully how we transfer into bacteria. We can do that. You've done that before. But this is into plants, so we can't do the same thing. We can't say that we take a plant cell and we grow it in a culture, and then we culture the cells, and then and so on and so on, because that's not how plants grow. So that's one mistake which people are going to make straight away. However, what we do do, which is exactly the same, is we obtain the gene, right? So we're going to get the gene from the bacteria, first of all. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut gene from bacterial chromosome. So we cut the gene from the bacterial chromosome, and now we've got the gene. Now, that gene might not have been on the chromosome. It might have been on the plasmid, so I'm going to put that in brackets there. But you'll be able to get the mark for either one. Now, how do we cut the gene from the bacterial chromosome? Now, you'll remember that this is using enzymes. So gene is cut out using enzymes. And if you're very clever, then you'll put restriction enzymes. And if you're even more clever, you'll put restriction endonuclease enzymes. But just saying enzymes is absolutely fine for GCSE. Right. Now, you'll remember that in your books and in my videos, we stated that animals and plants are harder to genetically engineer. Right, it's harder to get a gene into an animal or a plant than it is into a bacteria. However, we can do it, and the way that we do it is we add the gene at early stages in development, right? So we're going to use enzymes to insert the gene into the plant chromosome, and that is going to be at an early stage of development. So we're going to say enzymes, add gene into plant chromosome, and I'm going to say at early stages of development. Because when the plant is fully grown, we can't do it. Because once it's grown, only those cells will contain the gene. The rest of the plant won't adopt the gene. So we need to do it really early so that all the cells, as a result of cell division, when the plant's growing, all contain the gene that we want them to contain. All right, and that's more than enough for three marks. So let's take a look now at the next part, which is on the next page. So question B, would you advise farmers to grow GM maize plants? This is four marks. So it says justify your answer by giving advantages and disadvantages of growing GM maize plants. Use the info in the box and your own knowledge to help you. Okay, a lot of people get really intimidated when they see this sort of question, but you should really 
be excited because four marks, really, we could probably write at least 10, 12 marks worth of points here. Let's have a look back at our text to start off with. So let's go through the passage again. Insects can be both useful and harmful to crops. Yep. Insects such as bees, okay, insects such as bees, bees are insects, pollinate the flowers of some crop plants. Pollination is needed for successful, for success, successful even, <laughs> sexual reproduction of crop plants. Got there in the end. So I'm going to say here straight away that... Um, the toxin which kills insects can kill the bees. So toxin kills bees equals less sexual reproduction. That's our first point in the bag. So what does it say on the next line? Some insects eat crops and other insects okay, eat the insects that eat the crops. Now let's say, for example, that an insect has eaten a crop that has produced that toxin. Then other insects eat those insects. These insects also are going to be eating that toxin. Also harmed by toxin. And now you can see we've got this chain of the toxin killing things. This is going to affect food chains. Right, because those insects might be prey for other animals. And if those insects are now dying, those other animals are now struggling. And then you have a knock-on effect. All right. Corn borers are insects that eat the maize plant. Well, I mean, this is an obvious advantage, right? So they are killed. So increases chance of survival. Just writing small here. Sorry if you can't see it of plants. I'm going to write maize plants just so we know. Of the maize plants, because if the corn borers are dying, obviously that's the whole point. The toxin is killing them. Um, the maize plants are more likely to survive, so that's good. Right. Okay, right. So scientists grow these bacteria in containers. The toxin is collected and sprayed over the maize crops to kill the corn borers. Okay, so what we're saying is that this toxin is sprayed Okay, to kill them. If those plants are then engineered to produce that toxin themselves, then do we need to spray them anymore? No, we don't. So that's another advantage. So no need to spray anymore. That makes things easier for the farmers, and it means that they don't have to buy the toxin. All right, so you can see we've really got four marks worth of points in just from um, annotating this passage. Without using our own knowledge, which isn't included in the passage, we've already seen four or five points here. So let's go back and let's get some of these points down. Right, I'm going to use colors for advantages and disadvantages. So advantages are going to be in green. And I'm going to say, well, survival. Obviously, you're going to write in sentences. Even though I guess this question actually doesn't uh, doesn't say that you're going to be marked on your English, so you don't have to write in sentences. You could write in bullet points if you wanted to. So survival of maize increased. Right, that's just because we know that the toxin is going to be killing the corn borers. What's another advantage? No need to spray toxin. Well, the plant's producing its own toxin, so we don't need to spray it anymore. Now this leads to greater crop yield for the farmer. I'm putting brackets here. Higher profit. A farm is of course a business and they need to make a living. And if you can make sure that your plant's not dying, that means that you're gonna earn more money out of it, which is a good thing. Now one more thing I'm gonna say is that if you're spraying, okay, you're physically spraying liquid toxin onto plants. Now when it rains, where does that toxin go? Well, the toxin can be washed off and it can go into the soil. And where does water from the soil go? Well, eventually it's either going to be taken up by the plants or it's going to be evaporated or a lot of the water is going to end up in the water supply. And this is a big problem because this toxin can start to kill other things in the water supply. So we know that no toxin will be washed into the water supply 
because if the plant is producing it itself, it's not a physical spray, it can't be washed off into uh, another place where it wasn't meant to go. All right, I realize that I'm doing way more points than we need, but this is just to show you that there are loads of ways of answering this question. You could really only use one or two of these points and use one or two uh, disadvantages and give an opinion and then that'll be it. So let's do some disadvantages now in red. Okay, so remember we said that bees affected and I'm gonna put other insects reduces pollination and sexual reproduction. Okay, you could carry on and say, well, that in turn re reduces genetic variation and so on and so on. Um, but I'm going to leave that there because that's perfectly valid as a point. Okay, the next one. Food chains. Food chains affected. Because if this toxin is being swallowed by insects, which are then eaten by other insects, and so on and so on and so on, we are really disrupting the natural food chains and the natural ecosystem. So food chains affected as insects um, with, I'm just going to write with, toxin are eaten. Okay, so that toxin is passed through the food chain. Okay, one other <clears throat> problem could be that this could have adverse effects on humans. Even though there will be testing to show that it's safe to eat, you can never test and say, well, this isn't going to have long-term effects. Because, for example, if you eat a load of GM crops and they give you a long-term effect, which is going to sort of come into play about 20, 30 years down the line, you won't know that because there's no experiment that can tell you that that's going to happen. So I'm going to say possible effects on, on let's neaten this up. I think I've probably used the wrong version of effects. So there we go possible effects on human health okay because that's definitely an issue okay now I did four points um, for the advantages so I'm going to do one more for a disadvantage well if other insects are going to be affected and food chains therefore are going to be affected and also bees stop the sexual reproduction of maize this reduces the genetic variation other food chains being affected may also cause species to not uh, survive in the area anymore. They might have to move into other areas. And this is, in total, going to reduce biodiversity. Biodiversity. Because you've got no genetic variation, or no, you've got reduced genetic variation in the maize. It means that they can't produce new species of maize, and they can't... Um, obtain new characteristics because there's less sexual reproduction and also other um, other species may be driven out of the area it means the biodiversity of the area goes down and that is always going to be a negative thing all right then and that brings us to the end of question eight which in fact brings us to the end of the test so it's been quite a long video Thanks for watching. Um, if you do have any questions on anything that I covered in the video, please do feel free to write them in the comments or send me a direct email and I'll be sure to go, um, oh, sorry, I'll be sure to get back to you. As usual, please do like and subscribe because there are more videos coming very soon. But I look forward to seeing you in the next one.